Hey everyone, thanks for learning to play games. My name is Lance, and in today's video, I'm going to teach you how to play Burn Cycle. This is a brand new one from Chip Theory Games. It is a one to four player game that takes roughly an hour per player that is playing, and is a fully cooperative game where all the players are working together to complete whichever mission they've chosen to go on. So in this video, this is a big one, so I'm going to jump right into the video. I don't want to give you too much as this is going to be a long video. There's a lot to go over with this, but I'm going to teach you how to play Burn Cycle, starting with components, then set up, player turns, and end game conditions, and any additional rules that need to be covered. As always, if you find my videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button and subscribe to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we can continue to grow and produce the content like this. As always, if you want to get notified when I release new videos, give that notification bell a ring, and that'll let you know when I drop some new stuff. I also have a link on the top corner if you want to see a playthrough of this one. I shot that a little while back as well. And let me know in the comments down below if you notice anything incorrect on this or any part that I messed up or if you have any other questions. I know there's a lot with this one and I've done my best to make sure that everything is as correct as possible. I did shoot the video over to Chip Theory themselves and they had a look at it as well and gave me the thumbs up on this. So let me know if you catch anything and let me know if you want to see anything else around this video as well. Other than that, let's go ahead and head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. First, let's start by looking at the main set of dice you're going to be using throughout the game, which are the action dice. And there are going to be three levels to these, basic, advanced, and elite. With the basic dice, each one is going to have two sides with a blank, three sides with a one, and one side with a two. Moving into the advanced dice, you're going to have two sides with a one, three sides with a two, and one with a three. And then finally, with the elite dice, you're going to have two sides with a two, two sides with a two and a reroll, one side with a three and one side with a three and reroll. Each time a reroll comes up, you can reroll a die of your choice, including the die that has the reroll on it. From there, then, there are six different decks of cards that players are going to be interacting with throughout the game. The first that I'm looking at are the keypad cards, and each time you try to open a door, you're going to reveal one of these cards. That is going to list, first off, it'll be broken down into the three different levels. Each level is going to have requirements either you can choose to meet, or you can try to brute force it, which will have a number of action points listed on the bottom. Now, some of these will also list a jam, which means that you cannot brute force those. You must use the sequence that is listed in order to complete those. And I'll go over these more later. Imperative cards are going to give players a small handicap. Each one of these cards will list the name of the card on the top, the effect of the card, and then when it is met, they'll receive a number of power for that. For example, with the priority mandate, this one is the next time your agent would gain power, they do not gain po that power. But instead, they would gain some power for this. So depending on, depending on how you use this, it could actually be more beneficial. Mod cards, once installed, will grant a player a permanent effect for the rest of the game while it is equipped. Each mod card is going to list the name of that mod on the top, along with its effect, and initially when a player gains a mod card, it will be uninstalled, and they can take a free action to install it, or to discard it for its power that is listed on the bottom, or to trade it to another player. Now, once a mod is installed, a player cannot trade it to another player, or when they can choose to discard it, they will not gain the power listed on the card at that point. The equipment deck is going to have all kinds of useful items that the players will be able to use throughout the game. Each of these cards is going to list the name of the card on the top, along with its category or when it can be used, and its effect when you choose to use it. Now some cards are also going to grant a die, which will list a number in the bottom corner of the image that's going to correspond to the top number on the die itself. And there's going to be four different categories. Discard cards, it'll be discarded immediately to gain their effect. Single use cards, that once used will be discarded. Breakable cards, it'll come with a die, and if the die roll comes up with a caution symbol, then the, card, the die is broken and the card is discarded. And finally, counters that will have a set number on their die, and each time you use them, you'll move that die one space down, and when the die is at zero, you'll discard the card. Each time a player interacts with a terminal or mainframe, they're going to draw a terminal card. Each one of these is going to have three different options for the player. Each of these options will have a name, its effect, and an AP cost. When a player selects the option, they'll make an AP roll, and if they get equal to or greater than that value, they can trigger the effect that they've chosen. The final deck of cards are the network cards, which will give players little goals that they can try to reach during the network phase. Each of these cards is list the name of the card on the top, along with the colored node and layer that the player must land that on that colored node within in order to trigger the effect of the card that is listed there. And I'll go over this more later on in the video. From there, let's move over to the enemy units, and there's going to be three different types of enemies you're going to be facing throughout the game. The first are security units, and each of these will have its own chip with all the stats on that chip. So let's take a look at a breakdown of this. 
First off, each of the enemies will have a level, which is going to be indicated here, as well as on the back of the chip, as you're going to see in a minute, and will also be color coordinated. For those that are colorblind, you'll also have a special shape for each of the levels. Next is the enemy's movement stat, and this is the number of spaces it moves when it activates. Some of the security units will have an ability, which is going to be listed in the rules reference for a full detailing of that. Then you'll have the enemy's name, as well as its patrol pattern, and its front facing. Each of the security units is also going to have an awareness rating, which is going to have two different functions. The number listed is the, the awareness of that enemy in a straight line going from its front facing. And then second, you'll half this number, and that is its peripheral awareness, or the number of spaces around its non-front facing sides that it'll be aware of other robots. And I'll cover that more later in the video. As I mentioned earlier with the security bots, you'll have three different levels, levels one, two, and three, and each of these levels is going to contain different types of security bots, such as level one, which will have bulldogs, hamsters, and walkers, to name a few of them. And as the enemies move up in the levels, you'll notice that their stats are going to get better and better with them. And you'll also introduce new enemies, such as the radio head for level two or the ghost for level three. The second type of enemy you'll face are the captains, and you'll randomly select one of these at the beginning of the game. Each one of these captains will have its own ship, which will have all of its stats on it, just like the security unit, and will also come with an accompanying card. This card is going to have all the other information for that captain, including when you reach the burn cycle chip, it'll have an action that is going to be listed on the captain's card. Each captain has an ability that will be outlined on its card, as well as its patrol pattern or effect, and then each captain will have a name the number of hit points that captain has, and its security detail, which is going to be where you're going to place security units for each one of the floors you're playing, and then when the captain is going to come out. On the back of each captain's card is also a backstory about that captain. The final type of enemy are CEOs, where players are not going to be directly interacting with them throughout the game. Each CEO is going to be the head of its corporation and will be placed in the middle of the network board and will control its pings, but will not have any special rules in the standard game. They will have additional rules in the rescue mode if you choose to play that, which is a downloadable PDF on Chip Theory Games' main website. There's also a number of different bots included in the game. Each one of them will have their own card that is double-sided, with the front side being the agent side, which means that it is controlled by a specific player. Each of these cards is going to list the name of that bot on the top, along with its role and innate ability, which is going to be its starting ability. Each bot is also going to have three upgraded abilities that you can purchase throughout the game. Each one of these is going to list the name of that ability, its cost, and its effect once purchased. Bots are also going to have three different stats going down the side, the first is the power bank limit, which is the maximum number of power points it can have at the end of its turn, and then its upgrade and elite maximum number of dice that it can have throughout the game. Some bots will also start with a die that will be placed here, and then you're also going to have their reserve allotment. You'll have its starting, ability, uh, starting reserve and upgraded reserves you can purchase throughout the game. On the back side of each bot's card is its command module side, which will be collectively controlled by all of the players and will not have its own turn. Each of these cards is going to list the name of the bot on the top, along with its role and innate ability. At the bottom of the card, each of the bots is going to have five of its burn cycle slots, and each of these is going to have a cost and power to unlock it. At the beginning of the game, the green slots will start unlocked, and each of the command modules also have a starting power amount. In Burn Cycle, each corporation is going to have a number of mission cards. And each mission card is going to have the name of that corporation on the top, the name of that mission, its length or number of floors you'll be facing in the mission, and its complexity rating. Each mission is also going to have a brief backstory about what is going on in that mission. On the back of each card is going to list each one of the floors that is going to be used for that mission and what objectives you have for that and might also include a different objectives based on the number of players that are playing. Once you all of the bots or meet once you meet the conditions of that objective, each one of the agents will gain a number of power points and then at the bottom is going to list the win conditions for that mission as well. With some of the other missions having different lengths, such as this one only has one floor, but is very complex. And if you look on the back side of the card, there's all kinds of different instructions, such as special setup instructions for the mission and different special objectives or special rules for that particular mission, as well as all of the different conditions that must be met in order to win it. 
Next, I want to go over the rooms as there's going to be a number of different icons in the rooms as well as the rooms are going to come with all shapes and sizes. So each room is going to list the name of that room on the top along with the type of room that it is and there are going to be four main types that are included in the game. Next is your team allotment or reserve allotment. If you have a bot in here during the beginning of the game or during burn cycle reboots, you're going to gain a chip of that color. Next, some rooms will have one or more white cubes listed in it, which means that these rooms are going to start the game with a security bead in them. And then when a player moves into there for the first time, you're going to roll a number of white security dice based on the number of cubes that are in there. And each one of these is going to have different effects. From there, there's going to be all kinds of different icons in the room, such as cash icons, which when you are setting them up, you'll place a cash token on those spaces. You'll also have terminal spaces that'll have a terminal on them. There also is going to be objective spaces. These are only going to be used if the mission says so. Otherwise, this is simply going to be ignored. A lot of rooms are going to have a number of different doorways in them, and each one of these is going to have a little hole in it that once you unlock it, you'll place a token in there to represent that this door has been unlocked. Rooms are also going to have hiding spots in them that if a bot moves into there and they are, have not been detected yet, then they will not be detected while in this space unless a security bot moves into there. Other rooms are going to have safe zones that are going to have the yellow border around them. And once a bot is in here, they are safe for the most part, but I'll cover that more a little bit later. You're also going to have different security icons on there. These are going to be used if, for example, you end up rolling a security symbol on there, you'll be placing a security bot in that room and other ones will be mandated. So you'll have to start the game by deploying one in this space as the asterisk shows. And then there'll also be ones with letters in them. And that signifies if you're rolling the dice, if you roll one, you'll place it in the highest letter. Then if you have more, you'll be placing them in some of the lower letter letters, such as if you have A and B, this one would go into A and this one would go into B. The one other thing I want to mention with rooms is when they are connected with another room and you have doorways on both sides, if you unlock the doorway on one side, you'll also unlock the doorway on the other side. So you don't have to unlock both doors when they are connected to other rooms. All right, so ready to move into setup. So the first step is to select which mission we would like to play. For this video, I'm gonna go ahead and select the Operation Mega Market Sweep. So this is the same one that's learned in the Learn to Play manual. With this, it's going to tell you which corporation you're going against, as well as which floor you're going to start on, as you can see on this icon. Most of the missions will have you starting on the first floor, but some of them will start on different floors. So make sure you reference that as you can see here. From there, you're going to look into your floor plan book and set up the floor that you're going to start on. So again, this is going to be the level one floor on the knee, knee chain corporation. So with this, it's going to tell you all the different tiles you're going to be using and what to set up on them. So before I get into that, we have to place out the rest of the stuff we're going to be using for this. First off, go ahead and place out your different card decks and the tray that it's in all has all the labels in it, as you can see here for each one of the cards and where they go. Go ahead and shuffle up each one of those decks separately. Next, also place out all the different dice you're going to be using for this game. So I have mine separated into two trays. I have one tray with all of my action dice and the other tray with my equipment and the remaining dice in it. So I'm going to go ahead and stack these on top of each other and place those out and then you can also grab all the different tokens you're using as well and again you can separate these however you want to they do provide you with a way that they suggest in the rules but you don't have to follow that if you don't want to so I'm going to go ahead and place these over here for the time being and I'm going to keep these out in front of me as I'm going to be using them for the rest of this setup now for these different things each one of the security bot levels go ahead and shuffle up each one of those and then place them out so that they are so you don't know what they are Next, we're going to go ahead and randomize our captain. So in order to do that, well, actually, let's go ahead and set up the board first. So again, you're going to reference that floor plan manual, as you can see, and place out the remaining parts that you're going to be using for the floor, including all the caches, all of the um, terminals that you're going to have and any of the beads. So first off, let's go ahead and take care of the caches and terminals. Next, each one of the rooms that has one or more of the white cubes in it, you're going to place a clear glass bead in there. Now that we've completed that, let's go ahead and select the captain we're going to be using for this game. So let's go ahead and shuffle these up real quick and we'll randomize this. 
All right, and let's go ahead and select the one on top here. So we have Tendril. So she is going to be our captain. All the rest of these can be returned to the boxes. We won't be using them for this game. And she is going to outline the different floors, as you can see on her card, and which bots to place out. So let's go ahead and handle that real quick for our first floor. So we're going to have a level one bot. So we'll go ahead and draw the top one. And it is a hamster that is going to be placed in location one. And it's going to tell us the facing of that. Next, in location two, which is over here, we're going to have a level two bot. And so we have a radio head, and it is going to have a key underneath it. So we'll go ahead and place him out, and he's going to be facing that way. And then finally, a level one bot in location three. So we have another hamster, and he will be up there. Then our captain can be placed somewhere else. Now there is a nice little tray in the back here. You can place your captain and your mission card in for reference as you need it. For player setup, each player will choose one or more bots that they'd like to play and then flip them over to their agent side. Next, each player is going to gain a agent mat per bot that they're playing and they'll also gain the pegs of that color. Then let's go through a breakdown of the board real quick. So each player's mat is going to contain three abilities that they can unlock throughout the game. Each one of these will have a cost and power they'll have to spend to gain that ability. They're also going to have two slots for dice that they can place in there from either equipment or mods that they gain throughout the game. You'll have spots for each one of your reserve allotments. As you gain those, you'll have to spend power to do so. You'll have a spot for your reserve action tokens, as well as a spot for some of your other tokens, such as your awareness token or keys you can place in this slot. And then finally, you'll have your gauges for your power, your advanced and elite dice. Moving back into setup, each player will start with 10 power, and they're going to enter into a pre-game route power section where they're going to spend some of that power to gain some of their abilities in that down to their maximum power, or you can also spend below that, but you want to be careful because this is the number of hit points you have as well. So for example, with Bite here, I'm going to go ahead and start by spending two power to upgrade one of my dice to an advanced die. So I'm going to go ahead and place a peg in there. Next, I'm going to spend two more power so that I can gain one of my allotment reserves, and I can choose any one of these. So it happens that all three of these are the same color, but with other bots, they might be different colors, so you can choose them in any order you want to. You don't have to start with the first one. And then I have two additional power left that I must spend. I can, again, spend additional power beyond that if I want to. I'm going to go ahead and spend the last two to unlock one of my abilities, the Silent Entry. Now, I can also spend some of this power to upgrade the command module, and I can combine some of that with my teammates to upgrade that as well. So, for example, if I wanted to do something with the command module that costs three power, I could spend two of mine, and one of my teammates could spend one of theirs. And I'll cover that more during the command module step. To set up the command module, first you're going to choose a bot that you have not selected to play as an agent and flip it over to its command module side. From there, before moving into the rest of this setup, let's go ahead and break down the command module dashboard. So on the side here, you're going to have two spots for equipment and mods, as well as their dice. Now, a command module cannot use equipment and mods, but you can carry them, and throughout the game, you'll be able to trade them to other players. You also have going to have a spot here to hold your awareness chip and keys and other chips that you gain throughout the game. And you'll have underneath that your five spots for your burn cycle. And I'll explain how to set this up in a minute. From there, then you have your three standard upgrades you can gain throughout the game and your power track. Now with a command module, it will not gain 10 power at the beginning of the game. Instead, it's going to gain its maximum power limit, which is shown on its card. So with Crash here, he's going to gain six power. Then the players can collectively, again, choose to upgrade certain things on the mod. The players can combine their power and even use some of the mod's power if they want to to gain those upgrades. But if a player chooses that, the player must at least donate one power in whatever upgrade that they want to do. From there, then you're going to place the pegs on the different green spots on your burn cycle. So with Crash, he's going to start with his first three spots active. You're also going to place a red glass gem underneath on the number one slot. From there, then I'll show you how to set this up a little bit later in setup. To set up the network board, first reference the mission you selected, and based on that corporation, you'll place the CEO of that matching corporation in the middle of the board. Also place out the red network level die and set it to one, and the four red pings can be placed in the four spots around the top here as well. 
Next, whichever player was selected as the first player will place their network level die and set it to one in the top right corner. And then they'll also place out a colored peg of their matching color. Now this peg for the rest of the game is gonna be considered the IP of that player. And then you'll continue doing this for each player in clockwise order. You can also choose to place the threat tracker next to the network board and set it to whichever difficulty you want to. So for my game, I'm going to go ahead and use standard, but if you need an easier setting, then you can choose the simplified version as well. Go ahead and also place out two red glass tokens, one at the top here to track the threat, and then one on the side so that you know when you hit certain thresholds. The last couple steps of setup is first off, you're going to choose where the players are going to start. So I'm going to go ahead and have Byte start down here and Processor I'm going to put up here. So pretty much close to the Learn to Play and then I'll have Crash down here with Byte. From there, then we can gather up our reserve and based on the number of players, as you can see on this chart here, you might get extra reserve allocations. So with this being a two player game, as you can see here, each one of our players will get one additional reserve. So each one of our players gets to choose one of those to gain. So processor will gain a blue and Byte only has blue options. So he will also gain another blue. From there, let's go ahead and gather up our reserve. So each one of our players will receive their reserve. So Byte is going to get a purple and two blues. So I'll go ahead and pull these out. And he can place those down here. And then over to Processor, he's going to get two greens and a blue. Finally, we'll gather up our team ones. So each one of our different bots is going to start on one of these locations and later on when you're in the when you redo your burn cycle and i'll cover that later as well if you're in rooms or if you start in rooms instead each room is going to have the different token you're going to get for that as i covered in the room section already but one thing to keep in mind is if there are multiple bots in a room only one you only get one extra token for that so with that being said, we're going to get another blue, a green, and a blue. So two more blues and a green for our reserve up top here. And those are just placed off to the side. Then let's go ahead and set up the burn cycle itself. So based on the number of active burn cycle slots, so right now we have three, we're going to gain, we're going to place the captain token in the bag as well as two or a number of generics so that we have that number in the bag. So we have three active spots, so we're gonna have three tokens in the bag. We'll go ahead and shuffle these up real quick and then randomly draw them and place them out on their active sides. So first off, we're gonna start the turn with the captain and then the rest, we already know what they are. So we'll have two generals in there as well. You'll place the red bead on, on the bottom at the number one slot as I already covered. And then each one of the bots is going to receive an imperative card to start the game with. So I have buffering for bite and for processor, I have follow your node. Next, you're going to check your rooms and look for any of the rooms that have the security symbol that has the star in the middle of it, as you can see here. So I do have one in the security room. So that room is going to draw one bot of the level that we're currently playing, so level one, and place it in the room. So we have a walker and he's going to be facing the wall. Now, none of our other rooms have that. And the final step in the game is to choose a starting player, and you can do this in any manner you want to. For my game, I'm going to have Byte be the starting player, so the player to that player's right is going to receive the corporation token, and that will represent the last player during the turn, and will signify when the corporation will take its turn. So the processor or purple player is going to have that token. From there, we're ready to move into the game. Burn Cycle is played over an undefined number of rounds. During each round, it is broken down into two phases. The player phase, where each player will get to take a full turn, starting with the first player and proceeding clockwise around the board. And then when all the players have gotten a chance to take a full turn, then the second phase in the round is the corporation phase, where the corporation will get to take a turn. This is going to continue playing round after round until the players collectively meet the objectives of the floor that they're on, moving on to the next floor, or complete the objectives of the mission that they are on, completing that mission or meeting the fail conditions for that mission, in which case and all the players have lost the game. There are two very important concepts I need to cover next. These are adjacency and awareness. And if you don't understand either one of these, the game is not going to work. So you need to make sure you understand how these work before really progressing to the next part of this. 
So from there, let's move into adjacency. So adjacency is only going to be considered orthogonally, which is any space that is connected by another space with a flat edge, not diagonally. Next, there are going to be certain things that are going to block adjacency, such as walls. So this space is not considered adjacent to this space as there is a wall separating them. If the wall is destroyed, then these spaces would be considered adjacent. The other thing is going to be locked doors, and this is going to have an impact based on the units. For bots, which are both agents and command modules, locked doors are going to block adjacency. With security units or captains, they will not block adjacency as security units can move through locked doors without having to unlock them. So from there, let's look at a couple of examples of this. First off, with Byte, he is going to be adjacent to both of these hallway spaces. He will be adjacent to this walker as the doorway is unlocked, but he is not adjacent to the bulldog as the doorway is locked at this point. Next, with the hamster, the hamster is not adjacent to this room as there is a wall there. He is adjacent to Crush even though the door is locked because he's a security unit and locked doors do not block adjacency for security units. The other concept is awareness and before getting into this I do want to cover areas as that is also going to be very important for this part of this. So the board itself is going to be broken down into a number of different areas. The hallway will make up one area and each room is going to make up a separate area. From there, moving into awareness itself, this is going to be applied to security units and for, to captains, and this is going to apply at all times dur during a game. From there, each security unit has a awareness rating that is going to first be extended out of its front arc, which is the number of spaces listed. So our hamster here has a awareness of six spaces in a straight line from his front arc, and then you half that number to get his peripheral awareness. Now, important thing with this is that it only is going to be applied to the area he is in. So he will not have awareness in other areas that he is not currently in. So from there, moving into an example with Hamster here, I do have awareness on Byte as he is within my front arc and the number of spaces. So Byte has been detected and I will place his awareness chip on him. Now, at a later point, if Byte moves out of, his, of the Hamster's awareness, he will leave his awareness chip in the last space that the hamster knew he was in or has or has is within his awareness range now with hamster again he is not aware of processor even though processor is adjacent to him and there's an open doorway processor is in a separate room or separate area so he is not going to be detected by hamster even though he is in within his awareness as well Looking at another example with Walker, he has a peripheral awareness of one space to his peripheral, and this is not going to extend through walls. And again, it's isolated to an area since Walker is in a room, he is not aware of anything that is going on in the hallway. The next example I want to look at are hiding areas, as these are going to be important to staying hidden with your bots. So hiding areas, if you move into them successfully, even if they are within the awareness range of a security unit, will not be able to detect your unit. Now, if your unit is already detected and they move into a hiding area, if it is within the awareness of the security unit, then they will remain aware of your unit, even in a hiding area. So looking at an example of this, right now our bulldog, the Bulldog is aware of Crash, so we have to place his awareness token on him. But let's go ahead and say that, it, that Crash wants to move into this area here. He is going to move into this area, which is outside of the peripheral awareness of Bulldog, so he will leave his token over, his awareness token here, and he is successfully hidden from Bulldog in this situation. Going back to the previous example though, let's go ahead and say the Bulldog was here instead. He is within the peripheral awareness of Bulldog, so he has his detection or his awareness token on him. And if he moves into this area, he is still within the awareness of Bulldog. And so he will not be successfully, or he will not hide successfully and is still going to be, a Bulldog is still gonna be aware of him. And the last part of this I wanna cover is moving through doors. So let's look at another example of this. Let's go ahead and say that Processor is in this space here. And right now he is detected by Hamster. So he is going to move into this room, which normally a security unit is not aware of a bot in another room or in another area from their area. The one exception to this is in this situation, if you are still within the range of the security bot's awareness that will extend to the first space in a room. So with processor, if he continues moving at this point, his awareness chip will be left 
in the first space of the room and hamster might pursue him into that room at that point. Now, this is only true if the hamster's awareness goes into that space. Otherwise, even if the hamster had space to there, he would not detect processor at that point. It would stay in the space, the first space of the doorway. Likewise, if we move hamster back one more space, then he would not be aware of processor moving into the room. He would leave his, his awareness chip in the hallway right outside that door. The other important thing with this is with the safe zone. So with the safe zone, if a, you are aware, if you have your awareness token on there and you move into a safe zone, even if the bot has awareness into the safe zone, your chip will not move into there. Safe zones are the one exception to that rule. And so your uh, awareness cho chip will stay outside the room. Now, once in a safe zone, if you do anything that would cause you to drop your awareness token, then you still will do so and, and security units will pursue you into safe zones at that point. The next important concept I wanna go over is AP checks. There's going to be a number of different things in the game that are going to have you do these checks. And in order to do this, you're simply going to choose any number of dice in your pool and roll them. So for example, I'll go ahead and roll these three. If you roll any blanks, if you have a pair of blanks, you can convert that into a one. Otherwise, the blanks can be returned to your area. Then you're going to total up your amount and depending upon the check, some checks will allow you to spend the amount in any way you want to, such as movement checks. Other checks will have a specific number that you must roll equal to or greater than in order to be successful. If you're successful, you'll carry out the effects of that, such as a strike or destroying a wall or whatnot. If you're unsuccessful or either situation, you're going to return any dice you used back to the supply. Moving into the first round of the game, we're going to start with the player phase. And during the player phase, each player starting with the first player will get to take their turn. And during a player's turn, it consists of six steps that the player is going to do in order. Route power, dice pool, actions, network, route power, and degrade the burn cycle. I'm going to take you through each one of these steps in more detail to explain how this all works. The first step in a player's turn is to route power, and this will allow the player to spend some of their power to improve and upgrade some of their abilities. In order to do this, you'll spend your power by decreasing your tab a number of points based on what you want to upgrade, which can be improving your dice, gaining additional reserve allotments, improving and gaining some of your unique abilities or standard abilities, and you can do this in any order you want to. Now, a couple things to point out with power is you can never have more than 10 power, so you definitely want to spend it as you gain it. And at the end of each player's turn, they must have power that is equal to or less than their maximum power. So if you have more than that, you definitely want to be able to spend it during your turn so you're not wasting it. Now, since we already covered this at the beginning of the game during setup where we got a free route power action, there's not much to do during this first step. During the route power step, a player or the command module can also spend power to upgrade the command module itself, unlocking additional burn cycles or abilities. An important thing with this is that you are allowed to combine power to do this. For example, if I want to unlock this ability here that costs six power, I could choose to spend four power from the command module and two power from the active player to unlock this particular upgrade. Now, another important thing with the command module, it is still capped at 10 power, but it does not have its own turn, so it will not have to spend power to get down to its maximum power. This is simply the power it will start at at the beginning of the game. So during the game, a command module can gain additional power that it does not have to spend if it doesn't want to and can hold on to it. Now, you cannot spend a command module's power to upgrade a player or agent board. The second step in a player's turn is to generate their dice pool. In order to do this, you're going to consult your power, and whatever your current power is, is the number of blue dice you're going to gain. So with Bite, he's going to gain four blue dice, as he has four power. And then you're going to do the same for your advanced and elite. So with Bite, he has one advanced, so he'll gain one yellow die. And he has no elite dice unlocked currently, so he won't gain any reds. Now this is the only time during your turn you're going to be generating a dice pool. So if you, for example, lose power during your turn, you will not lose dice for that. Likewise, if you gain power during your turn, you will not also gain action dice for that. Before moving on to the next step, I wanna revisit the command module and go over a couple more things. So the bottom of the command module is going to be the burn cycle, and there are going to be five slots in this burn cycle. Each one of these slots will have a number on it, and if it is active, it'll have a peg above it. 
Then throughout the game, you're going to be placing different chips in these cycle in the, each of the burn cycles. And these chips are going to be double-sided with one side being the active side and the other side being the degraded side. And throughout the game, you're going to be constantly replacing these chips with other chips from your reserve or from the command module reserve that can include physical chips, utility chips, and tech chips among other ones. You also have the captain ship that is going to have an additional effect based on the captain that is selected for the mission. And I'll go into more detail about this a little bit later. The third step in a player's turn is the action step. And during this step, the player will get to take an action for each one of the active burn cycles in the burn cycle sequence, starting with the leftmost one and then working their way over from there. These actions are gonna be broken down into five different types of categories, which are physical, utility, tech, general, and free actions. And I'm gonna break down each one of these in more detail to show you how they all work. To start this step, the first thing we're gonna do is place the red bead in the leftmost slot that is above an active chip. So in my example here, I'm gonna be placing it in the number one slot. From there then, I'm gonna consult the active chip. If it is the captain ship, then I must resolve the captain burn cycle ability before moving in and taking my action. So in this example, let's go ahead and look at what the captain's chip does. So her burn cycle action, as you can see, is to surveil an unsurveilled room of your choice, set one of its room dice to shield instead of rolling it. So I can choose any room out here that has not been, that still has the clear bead on it. So I'm going to go and choose the restroom here as I probably won't be going into that room. From there, I'll remove the bead and then normally I'm going to consult the, above, the top of the room and then based on the number of white cubes in there, I would roll one die per white cube. This room only has one white cube and due to her ability, I would set that to a shield instead of rolling it. The shield is going to have me spawn a new security bot in that room in the, in the security bot spot. And so with that, it is going to be level one bot and it is going to be a walker. And so I'll have him facing the wall. Now that I've completed the captain's action, I can take my action. So again, with my action, I can choose any of the available actions that I want to, or I can choose to pass and move on to the next active chip. Again, as these chips get replaced later in the game, which I'll explain how to do, you'll have the different colored chips in there instead. So if the action you choose to take matches the same color as the chip, then it is going to be an optimized action. You'll get a little benefit to it, but you do not have to take that action. You can choose to take any action that you want to. From here, let's go ahead and start off with the physical actions. The first action I'll look at is a movement action, which is a physical action. So if the active burn cycle chip is purple, then this action will be optimized and you'll receive two additional action points to spend on top of anything you roll. My active chip is the captain ship, so this action for me will not be optimized. And so I will move on to the next step, which is to choose a number of dice for my pool that I wish to roll. I can choose to roll anywhere from zero all the way up to all of them if I want to. So I'm gonna go ahead and roll three of them and see what I get and I rolled two twos and a one. So if I had rolled any, any blanks, then those could be returned to my pool and I could choose to roll those again at a later point. If I rolled a pair of blanks, I can combine those, changing one of them to a one and returning one to the supply. Alternatively, I also have the tumble magnet ability on my particular agent, which allows me to change one of my results to match one of the other results that I rolled. So I have, I can change this one that I had rolled to a two matching the other dice. From there, I'm gonna add these up. So I have six action points that I can spend. From there, I can spend those to move my agent or the command module or split them up however I want to, moving them in any sequence I want. I do not have to allocate the dice beforehand. Each die or each action point I spend allows me to move my agent to an orthogonal space, which is up, down, left, or right. I cannot move through walls. I cannot move through locked doors or other bots, whether they are friends or enemies. So in this example here, Byte can only move to his left to start this out. So for this example, let's go ahead and say that I spend two points to move Byte over two. And then I'm gonna go ahead and spend two more to move Crash two spaces as well. I have two action points left to spend, but I don't wish to move them anymore at this point as I cannot move through the locked door and I don't really want to move down the corridor anymore. So at this point, these two are simply going to be wasted and the rest of these dice can be returned back to the supply. 
There's also a couple of other important things I want to cover with movement. So first off, let's go ahead and say that this door was unlocked. And so with this, let's go ahead and say as my as another action point, I move into this room. So if I move into a room with a surveillance speed, I must pause my movement action and resolve that first. So I would consult the room and based on the number of white cubes in there, I will roll a number of white dice and resolve the effects of that remove the cube, and then I can continue moving after that, spending any additional action points that I want to. You are allowed to move on to or through spaces that have cash tokens or terminals. If you move on to a space with a cash token, as part of that movement action, you can choose to collect that cash token and draw an equipment card, removing that cash token from the board. Now, if you choose not to collect it, and you stop on that space, you cannot choose during your next movement action to collect that unless you move off of it and then back onto that token. And the last thing I wanna point out with movement is if a bot has a key token, they can use that during their movement to unlock a door. Now, an important part with this is that it must be a movement action if they wish to use the key. They cannot choose to use an equipment card or something else that grants them movement points in order to be able to use the key. It must be a movement action. So in my previous example with Byte here, I had two action points remaining. If I had a key, I could choose to use that immediately to unlock this door, and then I can continue that movement action into the room. Again, pausing to resolve the surveillance speed as normal. The second type of physical action you can perform is striking a security unit or a wall. And again, if the burn cycle chip is purple, then this action will be optimized and you'll add plus two AP to your AAP check. So from there, let's go ahead and break this into two parts. The first one I'm going to cover is striking security units. So in order to do this, you must be orthogonally adjacent to a security unit, and it cannot be inside a room that has a wall between you. If, you're in, if it's in a room that has an open door, so if this door was open and I was here, I could strike it in that situation. But if there was one here, I cannot because this wall is blocking that. So from there, in order to strike a security unit, you must roll an AP check, which will have you rolling dice from your dice pool. And you can choose any number of those dice to roll. Now, in order to defeat or shut down a bot, you must roll equal to or greater than its durability. And as you can see on this chart here, each one of the levels has a different durability. And then the captain has a unique durability that will be outlined on its card. So with this being a level 1 security bot, it has a durability of 10. Now if I get 10 or more, then I shut it down and defeat it and remove it from the board. If I can get 5 points less than its maximum durability of 10, then I will stun it and it won't be able to activate this turn. In either situation, my agent will become detected and I'll play my, place my awareness token on him. And then let's go ahead and do the attack. So I'm going to go ahead and choose to roll all of my dice and see what we get here. So I got 2, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then I can again change one of those dice because of my tumble magnet. So I'm going to go ahead and switch one of these to a two. So that gives me eight points, which is not enough to defeat this. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that I did really well in this roll and ended up rolling 10. When I defeat a bot, I'll remove it from the board. I'll increase the threat by one. I'll increase my power by one. And that will finish the action. Now, in this example, I did not roll enough to defeat it. So in that situation, I stun the bot instead, and I will flip it over to its backside, representing that it is stunned and will not activate during the next corporation activation phase. Then let's go ahead and cover striking a wall. So in order to do this, again, you must be orthogonally adjacent to the wall in which you wish to strike, which can also be an exterior wall, which can be one leading to the outside space or the board edge, but unless the mission says otherwise, you cannot leave through these spaces. You are also not allowed to strike an area that has a door, even if the door is locked. And from there, then a wall has durability, just like when striking a security unit, the wall's durability is 10. And so you'll make an AP check, and if you can get 10 or more, then the wall is destroyed, and you'll place a destroyed wall token either on either end of that wall pointing towards it. You are also allowed to take a free action to move into that area as part of that action. Now, if you destroy a wall, then you will also become detected and will place an awareness chip on your character. And each floor can only have a maximum of three destroyed walls as you only have three destroy wall tokens. An agent or command module that is orthogonally adjacent to a locked door can choose to take a keypad action, which is also a utility action. And if you have a blue utility chip in the active burn cycle slot, the action is going to be optimized. And I'll explain what kind of benefit you get with that. Now, the first time you try to attempt to open a locked door, you're going to draw a keypad card. And then you'll have three different ways to resolve that that I'm gonna get into next.
There are three different ways you can unlock a door. The first is with the keypad card, and this card is going to have all three floors listed on it, and each floor will have a column of images you must resolve in order to unlock it using the keypad. Now, normally you're going to be using the floor that you're currently on unless a mission or something else changes it. So in my example, I'm on the first floor, so I would have to resolve the first column here. And the only image on the first column is a, a green tech symbol, which means I have to discard a green tech chip from either my reserve or from the command modules reserve in order to resolve this and open the door. The other way is to brute force your way through. Each one of the columns at the bottom is going to have a listed amount of AP that you must do an AP check and roll equal to or greater than in order to brute force your way through the door. Unless the at the bottom of the column it says jam, at which point you cannot choose to brute force it. The final way is with the key token. You can choose to discard a key token, in which case then you can just discard this and automatically open the door. Now, as you can see, as you get into the higher level of floors, this is going to become more and more difficult with some of the images on there, such as the white cube will have you roll the keypad die as well. And this is going to have all kinds of different images on it, including an unlock image, which means that the door is automatically unlocked and you will not have to resolve any of the other images on there. Now, a couple of important notes with this is first off, you have to resolve all of the images for the column in order to unlock the door. And so you cannot choose to take multiple actions doing some of these things and coming back to them. All of them have to be resolved in a single action. Now, you can choose to not open a door if you the sequence is too hard. And if it has a white cube, you'll reroll that the next time you try that or another player tries that. The other important thing to point out is if your action is optimized, you can choose to ignore one of the results on there. So with my first floor, if I had this action optimized, then I could choose to ignore this and then the door would automatically be opened as there is nothing else to worry about with this. Going back to my previous example, let's go ahead and say that Byte wants to unlock this door. So I would go ahead and start by drawing my keypad card. And this one and floor one is going to require me to discard a green tech token from either my reserve or the command module reserve. I don't have one in my reserve, but I do have one in the command module reserve. So I'll go ahead and discard that and unlock this door. So this can be discarded. And then I will place a green token in there to signify that door is unlocked. At this point, I can do a free move action to move into here. Now, this is not considered a move, so I would not be able to benefit from any of my movement abilities or anything like that. But if I choose to move in there again, I must resolve that surveillance bead as soon as I move into that room. And then again, the other option I have with this, again, I could try to brute force that by making a AP check. If I get four or more, then I have brute forced my way through that. And again, with my Tumblr magnet, I can choose to change one of those results. In that situation, I had brute forced my way through that door. And the final thing I want to point out is if I reveal a keypad card and I either cannot or choose not to handle it, this will stay by that door until it is unlocked. So if another player or if I try another action, I will resolve that same keypad card and not draw a new one. There are two different tech actions you can choose to take. The first one is the terminal action. If your agent or a command module is on a terminal or a mainframe, they can choose to take this action. And when they do, they're going to draw the top terminal card, go through the different options, and choose one of them that they would like to attempt. From there, they're going to make an AP check, so rolling any number of dice that they want to. So let's go ahead and say I have this file file server here, as you can see, an external hard drive where I can gain four power, which would be really helpful. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose to roll three of my dice. Eh, let's go with four and see if I can pull this off. And I rolled two, four, five, six. So I have enough there, and so I will gain the benefit of that. From that point, then I would remove the terminal or mainframe that I'm on, returning it to the supply. Now, if I would have failed this, you are still going to remove the terminal or mainframe token that you're on in either case. The other important thing to cover with this is if the action is optimized by having your active chip be a green terminal chip, then I would get to choose two of these options for a mainframe or terminal. And if I'm on a mainframe as well, these are all reduced to zero AP cost. 
The other tech action you can take is to draw a network card. And this is a great action if you don't really have anything else to do, as this will potentially give you good options during the network step. So with this, anytime you take this action, you'll draw the top card of the network deck and add it to your hands by your playing area. Each player can have a maximum of three of these cards. So if you gain another card or to gain a fourth card during your turn, you'll simply discard down to three cards. The other important thing to point out with this is if your active burn cycle chip is a green tech chip, you'll get to draw this for free and then take another non-optimized action. So even if you took another like terminal action that would qualify as an optimized action, it would not. It would simply be a non-optimized action, but it basically gives you a free card and a regular action you can take. Again, choosing any one of the different actions you can take. The next action we'll look at is a general action, and there's normally only one option for this unless your mission or your specific bot provides you with additional general actions you can take. General actions cannot be optimized, and the only one that you can normally take is a repair action if you've unlocked the repair ability on your bot. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example of that. Once you have the repair ability unlocked, then you can choose to take the general repair action. This action will allow you to transfer any amount of power that you have, as long as you retain at least one power, to any other bot anywhere on the board. So for example, let's go ahead and say that I want to transfer or repair two points of power from byte to processor. So then processor is going to gain two points of power. Now the one exception to this is you cannot go above 10 power regardless of the amount of power that's transferred to you. This is an excellent option if later in the game you need a critical roll or something where you need additional dice. This can be an excellent way to help generate those additional dice or if you need a critical upgrade or something like that, this is provide, it will provide that. As well as being able to bring a bot back that has been shut down. And the last set of actions I need to cover are free actions. These actions can be done at any time during your turn, even before your first step. And the only exception to this is that you cannot do these actions during or in the middle of another action. So if you're resolving some other action, you must resolve that first before taking a free action. But other than that, you can do these actions at any time during your turn. And there are generally two different free actions. You'll have trade actions and altering the burn cycle. Now there are equipment cards or mods or other abilities and whatnot that might provide other free actions that won't be covered in this section. The first free action we'll look at is altering the burn cycle. And again, this can be done at any time during your turn, just not in the middle of another action, dice roll, or effect that you're resolving. In order to do this, you're going to choose one of the burn cycle chips, removing it from the burn cycle and replacing it with one of the chips from your reserve or from the command module's reserve. If you choose the captain ship and it is still active and not been degraded, then you're also going to increase the threat by two. So let's say that during my second action, I know that I'm going to be doing a keypad action and I want to optimize that. So let's say that I replace this general chip with a chip from the command module's reserve for the utility. That way then I'll be able to optimize that action when I take it. The other free action I need to go over is a trade action. This is going to allow you to trade with another bot that is adjacent to you any equipment, uninstalled mods, or keys that either one of you have. For this example, I have the command module next to me, so I'm gonna go ahead and do a trade action as the command module has an uninstalled mod and a piece of equipment that it cannot use. So I'm gonna go ahead and gain both of these items and add them to my area. Now, an important thing with this is that you can only have two items or mods at any time. So I have three, so I have to choose one of these to discard. Alternatively, I could also trade that to the command module just to hold on to it. But for this example, I don't really need this mod, so I'm gonna go ahead and discard this. And since it's uninstalled, I'm gonna gain the two power from it right away and then discard this back to the supply. Each time you complete an action or choose to pass on an action, you're going to move the red bead to the next active burn cycle chip on the sequence. So for example, with this one, if this middle chip had been degraded, when I take my first action, I would pass over that and move straight to the third action as that is going to be the last one in this sequence. Otherwise, I would simply have moved it to the, to the right one space over to the next chip. And then I can take another action. Again, I can choose to take an action for each chip or pass on some of the chips not resolving an action. The fourth step in a player's turn is the network step. Before getting into this step, first let's break down the network board. So first off, each player is going to have a network level die as well as their IP peg. And the enemy is going to have a network die as well as the pings that are going to be the four nodes that an enemy has. 
The board itself is going to have four layers, as you can see here, and each one of these layers will have a number of colored nodes on it, as well as hubs, which are going to be the red stop sign spaces. The central hub, or layer four hub, is also going to be the core, which is going to have a number of benefits. And then you'll also have white lines in some of these sections, which are going to be transfer points, which will allow your IP or the enemy pings to transfer from one layer to another. At the beginning of your turn, you're going to reset the red bead back to the first space that has an active burn cycle chip on it. From there, you're going to take an action underneath each one of these chips that allow your IP to move one or more spaces in a clockwise manner around the network board. You are allowed to transfer one time during each one of your actions as well. And you can also pass on actions so you don't have to move if you don't want to. But if you choose to move, you have to move the maximum number of spaces that you're allowed to for that action. And there are two different types of chips for this. You'll have general and captain chips, which will allow you to move one space in a clockwise manner around the network, or the colored chips, which will allow you to move from your space to the next space of that color on the network, or if you land on a hub, you must stop there. So let's look at some examples of this. So first off, we have the captain chip, so that's going to allow us to move one space, so we must move from our access point to the first space on the first layer. Next, we'll move the, the bead over, and the next one is a general chip as well, so and that one is going to allow us to move one space going clockwise on the network. The final chip on the cycle is also general, so again, we can move one space or transfer one time to le the level two layer. So I could move to the blue layer here, or I can move to this hub, and then I will gain the benefit of that, which will increase my level network level die by one value. But let's go ahead and say, for example, instead that instead of that general chip, I had this purple chip here instead. So in this situation, I could choose to transfer one time, and then I would be able to move all the way to here. This is the next purple on that level. Or I would, if I continue on level one, I must stop again at this hub, even though there's a purple after that. I must stop on a hub and then gain that benefit. Now, you are only allowed to transfer one time per move action. So if I transfer down here, if there was another transfer, say here, I could not use that. I must continue on this layer since I've already transferred once one time on there. So there's a couple of important things I want to point out with the network. The first is if you have to move your IP into a space that has a friendly IP, you will simply pass over that space, even if this place, the space normally would have you stop on it. So for this example, I would normally have to stop on this hub, but since there is a friendly IP there, I will simply continue moving onto the next space in that sequence. Next is resolving network cards. So let's say, for example, that my player has the work orders folder network card, which will require me to stand, stop on a blue node on level one. So in this example, my next action is going to have me move to the next purple node. So I must continue moving to that next purple node. I cannot stop on the blue node and passing through no the blue node will not trigger this network card and it will not allow me to benefit from it. So with this example, I must continue moving on to the next purple, but let's go ahead and say for instead that that general chip was there. In that situation, I could choose to move to the next or one space in clockwise order. So I would stop here or I could go down here, but with this blue node, it is not on level one. So it would not complete this. If I move here, then I would complete this and resolve the effects of that. In either situation, any network cards that you have will be discarded at the end of the network step. The final thing I want to go over is if you have to move your IP onto a node or hub that has an enemy ping on it. Then in that situation, you will resolve a boot. First, you're going to check the enemy's level die with your level die. And whichever one has the lower level is going to be booted. So in this situation, this ping would be booted. I would place my ping on that space, and then I'm going to reduce my level die by one value. If I was tied, then the enemy ping would boot me back to my access point instead and would stay in that space. The fifth step in a player's turn is a second routing power. Again, this one allows you to spend your power to upgrade your agent or the command module. The one difference with this is at the end of this step, if you have more power than your maximum power allotment, then you are going to discard that power and move your peg back down to its maximum power limit. So with Bike here, his maximum power is four. So at the end of this step, if he has more than four points of power, I must discard those and bring it back down to four. So it's very important that you don't waste power and spend it to upgrade your agent or the command module as best you can. 
The sixth and final step in a player's turn is degrading the burn cycle. In order to resolve this step, you're going to roll the burn cycle die, and then based on the number that is rolled, you're going to degrade that burn cycle chip if there's one there. So for example, with this one, there's a couple of different things that can happen. If I roll a one, two, or three, as all of these are active, I would degrade whichever burn cycle chip is under that number. If I roll a four or five, I will continue moving to the next chip in that sequence until I find a chip that is not degraded yet. So for example, if I rolled a four on this die, this there's no chip here, so I move on to the next space, there's no chip there, so I would cycle back to number one and degrade the first chip in that cycle. The other result that you might come up with is a question mark, in which case then you can choose any chip in the sequence to degrade. The other thing is if, for example, let's go ahead and say that we rolled a three and that chip had already been degraded, again, you would continue moving until you find the next chip in that sequence that is not degraded yet. The one other thing I wanna point out before passing on to the next player, even after resolving this, you can still do free actions. So I could choose to do an alter burn cycle action to discard this degraded burn cycle chip and replace it with one from my, my reserve or the command module to help set up the next player so that they have a full list of actions that they can take during their turn. Alternatively, that player can also do that during any point during their turn up until they take that action. Once a player completes the six steps of their turn, it'll pass to the next player in clockwise order to take their turn. When a player that has completed their turn that has the corporation token, that is going to be the end of the player turns and you'll move into the second phase of the round, which is the corporation turn. During the corporation's turn, it's going to have three steps that it's going to do in order. The security activation, the ping activation, and threat advancement. I'm gonna take you through each one of these in more detail to show you how they work. The first priority I'm gonna look at is pursuit, and this is only going to affect security units that have a bot in their awareness. For this example, I'm gonna go ahead and place out a couple of additional bots to cover this example more thoroughly. So I'm gonna go ahead and put bits out here and access up here. So from there, then you are going to determine if any of the different bots are within the awareness of these security units. So right now with Hamster, he has an awareness of six, so he does have awareness of access. And so he will activate during this step. We also have a Hamster over here that has awareness of bit, and Radiohead also has awareness of bit. Now, Bulldog would normally have awareness to Byte, but Byte, due to her ability, Silent Entry, is treating this first space of the room as a hiding space. So until she moves off of there, she is not going to be detected by Bulldog. So he will not activate going after her. So from there, let's go ahead and handle this. So you would activate the bots and move them towards the bot that they have detected by the shortest path possible. So with, right, with uh, Hamster here, he is going to move two spaces towards access. If a bot ends its, or a security unit ends its move adjacent to a bot, it will attack it and do a number of damage based on its level, with captains doing three damage plus their bonus whatever ability that they have. And this is going to reduce that bot's power by that amount. So access would take one power loss from being attacked by Hamster. Then once you complete that, you'll flip that token over of that security unit, as well as the access token for the bot that has been pursued. That way you know that those have been resolved at this point. Next, with the hamster over here, he's gonna move two spaces towards bit. And so then his, his unit will flip over and Radiohead is going to do the same thing. His movement is two as well. So he's gonna move two and then flip over and make sure you try to keep the same facing of the security unit when you flip it over. At this point, then bit has been uh, resolved. So we'll flip his unit over. And again, Bulldog is not going to move. And the other bots or the other security units do not have any bots that they are aware of. So that will be the end of the pursuit priority. The second priority is investigate. And during this priority, each one of the awareness chips that is still out there must be investigated by the closest security bot. First, with this, I'm going to continue the previous example, and then I'm going to reset and show you a couple of additional examples. So moving back into the previous example here, we still have processors awareness chip that is out there, so that one must be investigated. 
The other two have been already handled during the previous priority. So with this one, I have to determine which one of the bots or which one of the security units is closest to his chip. So we have this one here that is one, two, three, four, five, six spaces away, or Bulldog, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces away. So Bulldog is, or the Walker is the closest one. So it is going to move two or four spaces towards that. So one, two, three, and four. From there, then I'll flip his token over as well as that awareness token as it has been investigated at this point. Now, if a security bot reaches an or a awareness token, then that token is going to be removed. And a security bot will not change its targeting priority even if it becomes aware of another bot when it is investigating. So for ex this example, I'm going to go ahead and move bits or bytes over here, and then I'm going to take and place processors awareness chip over here. And then we'll have Bulldog be here. So in this situation, Bulldog is the closest bot to this chip, and so he would investigate moving one, two, three spaces. And even though he is aware of bytes now, he is still going to be trying to make his way towards the processor awareness chip. So if he had an additional space of movement, he would not move down towards byte. He would move into this space with processor's chip, removing that awareness chip at that point. Another example of this is, let's go ahead and say that byte has his awareness chip here. With Bulldog, he is the closest unit to check that out. And so he has an equal amount of pathways that he can choose. He could go one, two, three here to investigate or one, two, three here to investigate. So let's go ahead and say we made a poor choice and had him move down. So he would move down two, and instead of moving into this space, he would stop, and now a bite has been detected, and his chip will be moved on there, and then the bulldog will attack bite in that situation. So normally a bot that is in hiding will not become aware unless a security unit would, would be forced to move on to their space. In that situation, then that bot will become aware even if it's in a hiding space or in a safe space. The third and final priority is patrol. This is only going to affect security units that are in hallways that have not activated yet or that have an ability that allows them to activate during the patrol step if they're in a room. So with this, they are going to simply follow their patrol protocols, which are listed on the bottom of their chip, as you can see here. And these are going to work in different ways depending upon the protocol that they have. So going back to my previous example, currently, I don't have any bots in the hallway that would patrol at this point as all of them have been activated. So this would end the, the security activation and then you would flip all of the security bots back over and make sure they're facing the proper direction as well as any of the other uh, awareness chips or anything that have been investigated at this point. But I'm going to go ahead and reset up and show you a couple of examples of this as well. So now let's look at a couple more examples of this. The first one we're gonna look at is Hamster. So with Hamster's ability, he is simply going to patrol back and forth in a straight line. So with him right now, he's going to move two spaces in the direction he's facing. But let's go ahead and say that he was here instead. In this situation, he is going to hit this wall and then he's going to rotate twice to the right to face the opposite direction and then continue his movement in the straight line. So he's gonna continue going back and forth on that. Next, we're going to look at Radiohead. So Radiohead has a unique ability that he is going to move towards the closest door. And this is the closest door in his area. So he's going to move towards the closest hallway door, which currently is going to be this one up here and not the any of the doorways that lead into rooms. So with this one being a hallway door, he is going to actually move towards that direction, making his way up into there. The final walker I want, or the final bot that I want to talk about, security bot, are the walkers, as they have a very unique ability. With theirs, they're going to be patrolling, and they're going to try to, to patrol in a counterclockwise manner around the board. Anytime you have to move them again, you're going to rotate them to the right or clockwise. So for this example here with the walker, he is going to rotate as he's against the wall, he cannot move. He's going to rotate to the right one time, and then now that he has a pathway, he's going to move down two. And then again, he's at a, a, a stops point, so he has to rotate again twice to get back on that path and continue on. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that he was already facing this direction and he was here. In this situation, again, he's going to move four, so one, two, three. And then again, he would rotate to the right, which is going to put him in that direction there. And then again, with bots in rooms, they are not going to move unless they have an ability that specifically says that they will. 
Again, once you've activated each bot, they will flip back over to their back side to signify you've activated them. At the end of this priority, then you're gonna go ahead and flip all of those back over to their, their face up side and make sure they're facing in the proper direction. The second part of the corporation's turn is the ping activation. And this is going to have a couple of steps that are gonna be done in order. First off, if there are any pings out on the network, you're going to move each of them, starting with the outermost layer and working your way in. Each ping that you have to move will move up to three spaces. It will stop when it reaches a hub, if it reaches a player's IP, another ping, or if it has completed moving its three spaces. Once you've resolved all of the ping's movement, if there are any pings that are on hubs, then you are going to roll the ping die for each one that is on there and resolve the effects. As you can see here, there's all kinds of different effects on this die. If you do not roll the die, as there are no pings on any of these spaces, instead any ping that is on a transfer point will transfer to the next layer outward from the layer they're currently in. And if after movement there are no pings on the board, you are going to start by placing a ping on the core. And then during the next part of that, then you will roll the network die and resolve the effects. So with this one here, this one is going to have you increasing the threat and also moving or transferring any pings that are able to transfer to the next ring. And again, you would roll the die for each ping that is on a hub. From here, let me take you through a couple of examples of these things in more detail. In this example, I placed out a number of pings and I'm going to activate them. You're gonna start with the pings on the outer layer, outermost layer, and then if there's multiple pings, you're gonna activate the ping that is furthest away from the other ping in clockwise order. So at this ping here, we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaces away. And on this one, we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So this will activate first. This ping is going to move three spaces, landing on the same space as the IP, in which case there's going to be a boot. So we're going to again check the two different levels. The purple player has the higher level, so this ping will be eliminated or removed, and the purple player's IP or level will go down by one. Next, our IP up, or our ping up here is going to activate, moving one, two, three. Unfortunately, that is the problem with having pings on the outer layer. If a ping moves past a access point that does not have a player's IP in it, that player is going to be permanently booted from the network until a reboot happens. So this is a horrible situation for the green player, and you'll remove both his die and his IP for the rest of this until we do a reboot. Then I'm gonna continue moving my way in. Again, I have two more IP or pings here. Uh, again, I'm going to move the one that is furthest along on this track. So this one will move one, two, and it would have to stop before it reaches that one. And then finally, this one will move one, two as well, and it can't move any further from there. Since none of the pings ended on a hub, you'll also transfer any that you're able to. The third and final step in the corporation's turn is thread advancement. And during this step, you're going to advance the thread bead a number of spaces based on the number of agents that are playing. In my game, I'm using two agents, so I'll advance this two spaces. Now there's a couple of different things that you're going to run into on this, more so on the standard side than on the simplified side. The first are threat events, and these are going to be the yellow outline spaces. Anytime you reach one of these spaces for the first time, you're going to trigger the effects of that event, and then you're going to mark it with the second red bead. That way you know that this event has been triggered as you can only trigger each one one time. So even if the red bead moves back and then back onto there, you will not resolve this event again. The second one you're gonna run into are the threat escalations, and these are going to be the red outline spaces. These spaces will only be active when the bead is on them or past them on the track, but if the bead moves back, then they will turn back off. So for example, with this one here, this is monitor protocol, level one doors are now level two. So this is going to be on Well, this bead is on there or past, but if we happen to move our threat back, then this will be turned back off and the doors will go back to being level one until the bead moves past there or onto there again. You will not mark these with the red space as these are not going to be one-time only things and will only be triggered again when the bead is on them or past them on the track. If the bead ever reaches the last point on the track, the mission is over and the players have failed. Once you've completed the threat advancement step of the corporation's turn, the round is over and you'll move on to the next round, starting with the first player again and again proceeding clockwise. And this is going to continue round after round until either you've met the objectives for the level you're currently on and moving on to the next level, or if you've completed the mission at that point, then you've won. 
There are a few ways you can fail a mission as well, which again is reaching the last point on the threat track, having all of your agents knocked out, having the command module knocked out, or there might be other ones specific to certain missions as well. So at this point, that will complete the turn sequence, and there's a couple of additional rules that I'd like to go over. So the first thing I want to go over is completing the current floor and then advancing to the next floor if there is one for the mission you're playing. So each mission is going to outline the objectives you're trying to complete for your current floor. For example, with the mission I'm trying to complete, I need to have one of my agents access a terminal. At that point, once that happens, then all of my agents will receive three power for completing that. The command module will not receive power for this. From there, then my agents are going to all need to be in safe zones along with the command module. At the end of any turn in which all bots are in safe zones, which again are going to be the zones with the yellow outline around them, the floor is going to be or is going to come to an end, and the players will advance to the next floor if there is one. If there is not one, then the players have won the game as they have completed all the objectives they needed to and all of the floors they have. So if there are additional floors, at this point there's a number of steps that are done in order. Whoever ended their turn will be will gain the or whoever ended the turn of the level will gain the corporation token, and the player to their left will be the new starting player. After that, then you're going to keep track of which bots are in each one of the safe zones, and if there are any security bots that made it into those safe zones, they also keep track of them as they will transfer to the next floor. You're also going to note whichever doors are unlocked in safe zones as they will remain unlocked in the next floor. From there then you can take a, down the entire floor and reset up for the second floor or whichever floor you're going to be advancing to next based on the floor plan book and then you'll place out the d your different bots in those same so uh, safe zones. You can rearrange their order that way then based on who's activating first or whatever you're not going to get all jammed up in there but you can rearrange their order within the safe zones that they went to. Any player that does not have an imperative card will get to draw a new imperative card and then you'll start off off with the first player taking their turn again. This can mean that you will be skipping over the corporation turn if the last player to go was the last player in the, the player phase. You will skip over that corporation turn and get to get or start a fresh turn with the first player proceeding with all the players before another corporation turn comes. So if you plan out when you advance on the floor plan, that can really help you out as well in the mission. The next thing I want to go over is rebooting the burn cycle, and this can happen before any player's turn. You cannot do this before the corporation turn, and you can do this anytime, even if you still have chips in the burn cycle that are active or chips in your player reserves. It doesn't matter. It is up to you as the players to decide when you want to do a reboot of the burn cycle, and you normally you want to hold out as long as you can, as this is also going to have some detrimental effects on the game. So from there, when you choose to do this, you're going to clear all of the slots that are on the burn cycle and any reserves that the players or the command module has. So with that, all of these will be returned to the supply. You'll add the captain ship back to the bag and a number of additional general chips to fill out all of the active slots on the burn cycle. So in this situation, I'll add two general chips in there. You'll shuffle these back up and draw them one at a time from the bag, placing each one in the leftmost space on that track. So we have two generals and then the captain ship. Once you've completed that, then you're going to advance the threat gauge a number of spaces based on the number of agents that are playing. I'm playing with two agents, so I'll advance that two spaces. And you'll handle any events or anything that is triggered from that. You're also going to return any of the different IPs that have been booted from the network, if there were any. And you can place them in any one of the access points that is open. They don't have to return to the same one that they started in at the beginning of the game. From there, then you're also going to regain your reserves. So each one of the players will gain their tokens based on the, what they have unlocked on their reserve. So with my player here, I'm going to get two green and a blue. My other player will gain a purple and two blues. And then the command module will, will gain a number of different chips based on where the bots are. If the bots are in rooms, they will each each room will provide a number a color chip based on that room. And you can only gain this one time. So if you have multiple agents in one room, you're still only going to get one chip for that. So I do have bites in the lobby. So I'm going to gain a purple 
agents in the hallway will not grant anything and agents or command module that are on the outer walkway will gain them if they're on a space that has one. So right now with my command module, he is not on one. So unfortunately, I only have one in reserve for my command module. At this point, then you would continue on with the player's turn as normal. The next thing I want to go over is shut down bots, which is going to happen anytime a bot is reduced to zero power. If this happens to an agent, you're going to advance the threat tracker by three points, and the agent's bot token will be flipped over to its shutdown side. At this point, the player, if it's their current turn, their turn will end, and they will skip over the rest of their turn. In subsequent turns, the player can still take a turn, they will only gain their power pool for their advanced and elite dice, and they can only use those dice to activate the command module. They also always skip the network phase until they gain power back and are shut their turn back on. A shutdown agent can regain power by having another agent repair them, giving them one or more power from their supply or if the players complete an objective. Now the players are not able to complete a floor with a shutdown agent. It must be given at least one power before a floor can be completed. And shutdown agents are not going to trigger awareness and will never be pursued or investigated by security bots. If a command module is shut down, then the game is over and the players have lost. Well, I know that was a lot of information. I hope this video helped you learn how to play Burn Cycle. I know there's a, there's a lot going on there, but once you get into the game, it does go a lot smoother. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate it and take into account everything you say to make the best possible videos. And until next time, I'll see you later.